Hi, I'm Billy Shore. This is Add Passion and Stir. We're in New York City today with the chef, Tom Colicchio, the president of Crafted Hospitality, and most people know him as the top judge on Bravo's top chef, head judge on top chef. Uh, it's great to have you here, Tom. Hey, Bill. Good morning. Uh, former Senator Bob Carey, who I had the honor of working with for uh, almost uh, six or eight years, uh, and feel like whenever he calls, I still stand up. When I'm at my desk, Bob, and the phone rings and it's you, it's just like, I'm on my feet. You're still my boss. Uh, but thanks for being here. You're welcome. Nice to be with you. You're now doing uh, a bunch of things, some of some of which are through uh, Allen & Company, uh, the investment bank. And you know, one of the things about both of you is you're both doing so many things. We'll be a little bit challenged here to figure out exactly how we hone in what we talk about. But I guess I want to start where we almost always start, which is just how you got to be doing this in the first place. So I'm sure you've told this story, That depends Tom, what, what, what this is. This is. Um, <laughs> um, cooking, I'll assume you like, mean cooking. Yeah. Um, you like, know, did I, you know from a very young age that you were going to do this, or did you have I, you a more know, winding path? I, I did. I was about 13 or 14 when I started cooking at home. And Home I, here in New York? Uh, New Jersey. I grew up in Elizabeth, New Jersey. And my dad... Um, you know, my, my dad wasn't the kind of dad who would sit, sit, sit you down and have these long, you know, discussions about your future. That, that just didn't happen in my house. But he, he had the ability, I guess, to instill in, in his children, my two brothers and I, um, to sort of find something that you love to do. And, you know, you, you, you won't really have to work that hard, or at least it won't feel like work. And my, my younger brother is a basketball coach. He's very, a very successful high school basketball coach. Um, he's won seven state championships. Uh, he coached one public school team for 16 years, just moved over to the second school. He took a team that went 12, won 12 games in four years and was 25 and up before he lost in the semifinals of the county tournament. So he's doing really well. My older brother is a CPA and now is a CFO for, for a, a company in New Jersey. So when I was 15 or so, my dad said, hey, you know, you like to cook. Why don't you think about doing it professionally? And I was like, all right, okay. And, and I think he had visions. How old of, were you at the time? I was 15. 15. And I had already, you know, cooked in a few restaurants. Yeah. And I think, you know, his vision of, of me being a chef was at some little, you know, bar type restaurant in New Jersey with, a, you know, a, a sleeveless shirt on, a cigarette hanging in my mouth, stirring the red sauce. <laughs> and, and, uh, but, but yeah, so, so from a very young age, I knew this is what I wanted to do. And I started wow. working in restaurants when I was, uh, you know, 14 or 15. And one of the things we found is that for a lot of chefs, and you probably know this better than I do, it's a more, uh, uh, a less linear path. There's a lot of chefs who sought to do something else first or maybe failed a couple times at pre-med or something. And then they decided what I really, what they really loved was that memory of being with their dad or their grandmother cooking in the kitchen. And it's like, why don't I, why don't I do what I really right. love? Right. So. Anthony Bourdain would say it's, it's the job you have before you go to prison and the first job you have when you get out. <laughs> 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 um, and, uh, and Bob, you know, we met when, and it was back in 1982 or 83 when, uh, I was working for Senator Gary Hart at the time. Um, and he was running for president and there was only one democratic governor in the entire country who endorsed him because he was running against the establishment candidate, uh, then, uh, vice president Walter Mondale. And that one governor was Bob Kerry. Um, it was a very thoughtful decision. I mean, I, I when I <laughs> when I ran for governor, which itself was you know serendipitous. Uh, uh, I mean, if I had run in any year besides 1982, I probably would have lost. But anyway, I ran for governor, and my one of my strongest opponents uh, was accusing me of being gay because I had supported civil rights for gays and lesbians, and I was single. So, and I was very good at being single. And uh, anyway, so and, and in uh, Nebraska at that time, that must have been a political right. That yeah, was that, like a political <laughs> challenge. Right, right. So uh, anyway, so now I'm governor, and I get a phone call from this guy who was a prominent labor leader. He says, uh, uh, I'm, "I'm calling you because I want you to be involved with the Mondale campaign." And I said, "I got bad news. I'm not supporting Mondale. I'm supporting Gary Hart." Well, I didn't know Gary Hart. I didn't know what his platform was. <laughs> I just knew I wasn't supporting the other guy. <laughs> Very thoughtful. Very thoughtful. Yeah. And but and before that though, I, you weren't a chef, but you were a restaurateur in a way, right? I was. Yeah, yeah, I don't know way. if you knew that, but Bob right. had a chain of how many restaurants? Well, chain. Uh, is a, it's a pretty small chain. We had five. Well, that counts. So, yeah, that counts. Yeah, that counts. I learned a lot. I mean, you learned a lot when you're taking care of customers. Yeah, and you've both played actually an enormous role in uh, the the life of Share Our Strength. Uh, Bob, when I joined your staff, uh, I remember saying to you that Share Strength was then only less than 10 years old. It was really taking off. I had to 
um, devote myself to it. Uh, you asked me to be chief of staff, and I said, I can't be chief of staff because I'm doing Share Our Strength part-time. And you said, well, that's that's why I want you to be my chief of staff, because I love what you're doing with Share Our Strength, and you were so supportive, and I, don't, I doubt there was another senator uh, in of 100 that would let their chief of staff also go across town every day for a couple <laughs> hours and uh, and try to build a nonprofit, um, which was really amazing and kind of, I don't know, symptomatic of just the unconventional way in which you do a lot well, of things. Well, but you no doubt remember, at some point, I've also said to you, you know, you're burning the candle at both ends, you're killing yourself, you got to leave, you got to pick one or the other. It's and, yeah, no, it, no. Was, <laughs> it was pretty hard running back and yeah. forth. Um, and then, uh, Tom, I, I wish you'd have been here a couple of weeks ago because Tom has not only been involved in Share Strength from the very beginning when he was at Gramercy Tavern and a co-founder and a, a partner at Gramercy Tavern, but just uh, three or four months ago, we did uh, an auction mm-hmm. to at we did a dinner at Union Square Cafe. It was the 25th anniversary of an event we do called the Autumn Harvest Dinner, and we were auctioning off a dinner of the uh, original Gramercy Tavern chef. Uh, Tom and Claudia Fleming, mm-hmm. the pastry chef, and the current chef, um, Michael Anthony. Michael Anthony. And uh, the, the the auction was kind of going so-so. And Tom was standing off to the side, and he just like, he this was like what a CEO does. He just strode to the center stage, took the mic, and he said, okay, let, let me take this auction item. And it got up to $90,000. Right. Two people right. bidding against each other, $90,000 to just come and have these three. Right. And, then, and, we, and we, we gave it to both of them. We actually, and we gave it to we both had, of them. We, so we raised $180,000 right. in about five or 10 minutes, mm-hmm. uh, thanks to Tom. And then Rosemary and I were lucky enough to get invited to one of the couples. Uh, it was the... The um, uh, chef, uh, chef, the writer John Grisham and his mm-hmm. wife Renee, who've right. been very active with us, they invited us to a, a dinner, and we got to experience the cooking, and it was right. really that was, quite phenomenal. That, that was a great night. That was only the fourth time I've been back in the restaurant since I left. That must be a weird um, feeling. It, it was. I think I mentioned at the dinner. It, it was kind of like returning back to your childhood home. You, you know, the walls cover all where they were, but someone like rearranged the furniture and put different art on the walls, <laughs> and so it was, it was it was familiar but kind of weird. Um, but it was it was a great night. I was. I, I was there last night. There was an event last night in, uh, at the restaurant. So it was uh, Food and Wine Magazine's 10 Best New Chef Dinner. So um, it's, it's always good to go back there. But it, it, it does, uh, it, it holds, uh, you know, a lot of great memories. But, you know, I, I sometimes think that um, I don't have many regrets in my career. Um, Danny and I had this deal where I was going to buy the restaurant from him. And last second, I was like, you yeah, know what? Why don't you just buy it for me? And I, every now and then, I regret that. Um, it's, it's such a great restaurant, but I had my reasons for doing it. So it is a great restaurant. Well, uh, I, I think of you both as very political. And before we get to kind of the, the politics of the day, um, one other thing that I wanted to touch on with you, uh, Tom, was the other big influence you've had on our work is um, your wife, Lori Silverbush, made a very important film um, called The Place at the Table that uh, was about hunger in America uh-huh. and really showed people, I think a lot of people for the first time, what hunger actually looks like. Right. Um, so I know you're involved in a number of different issues, but talk a little bit about your, your passion for the hunger issue sure. in particular. Well, it, it started, again, going back to when I, before Gramercy Tavern, when I was at Mondrian, we would always do fundraisers for, for Share Our Strength. And back then... Um, if you were invited to do this fundraiser, it was like you were kind of welcomed into a, a community of chefs. And, and I would say chefs are kind of like the first responders of, of, of causes. We're always there to help raise money. And so, and I was okay doing that, raising money. And I think I attended a boot camp, a, 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 um, a media boot camp that you guys yep. had sponsored. And I, and I went through that. And I thought I knew a bit about the issue. And, you know, I grew up in knowing that friends of mine were hungry and they would get food from the church. And my mother ran a school cafeteria program. My wife was mentoring a young girl. And she was living in a shelter. She had, we figured, found out that she had learning disabilities. Um, in New York City, if the public school system can't meet those, those needs, we can get her to a private school setting. We did. We received a phone call the first week of school that this young woman was clearly hungry, uh, asking for food and scrounging around in the garbage looking for food. This school didn't have a breakfast or lunch program. My, my wife, you know, we would invite her to our house. We would send her food home. We realized we were putting a Band-Aid on it. And... So my wife decided to explore the issue of hunger in America. And very quickly, and 
there were so many you know people including yourself that we that my wife spoke to it was in the film as well but where and this is where is where we, it led me to to politics i had a, a soapbox because of my you know i'm on tv and and i'm fairly well known but right away we figured we found that that people aren't hungry you know this people aren't hungry in this country because of famine because of war because of uh, uh, drought it's bec- we have we have enough food to feed people we don't have the political will to feed people and so we really thought that that was a message that we wanted to really push on. There's so many great organizations that are doing great work of feeding people and trying to get resources to people um, in need. But we also realized that if big cuts were made to the SNAP program, to the WIC program, to school lunch, there's no way that we can make up for the great work that the organizations were doing. Um, an example of that was we do an event for New York Food Bank. We raise two million dollars in a night. Everybody pats myself on the back and says, "Well, that's great," and it is great. But when we cut fifteen billion dollars out of the SNAP program, we would have to do that event every single day for like ten years. Check my math; it's probably wrong, but you know, it's it's to to actually make up for those cuts. Yep. And so we were really focusing on on the politics of it, which is you know. At the time, a lot of the organizations didn't want to hear that. But I think looking back on it, I think it was the right message because right now every single organization is also up there lobbying and focusing on politics, getting their their members um, or their supporters not only to volunteer and give back with your time and your money to the various organizations, but also to use your voice to demand that we fix this problem of hunger in this country. Well, I, I always have believed that there are things that nonprofits can do that government can't do in terms of taking risks and innovative and being closer to the people that we serve. But when it comes to scaling up those ideas, that takes public policy, sure. and there's, there's sure. really no substitute for it. So, Bob, after you were governor, senator, uh, presidential candidate, and then left the Senate, you probably could have stayed in the Senate a long time. Uh, what went into the, and now you're at Allen and Company, and I want to talk about education as well, because a, a lot of what we try to talk about uh, on the hunger issue, uh, we look at through the lens of education, because obviously hungry kids can't learn, and we've seen example after example of when we get kids school breakfast, when we get them fed, uh, attendance improves, test scores go up, attendance goes up, tardiness goes down. Um, and you're working on some pretty interesting uh, education initiatives. But but I'd love to start just by, by hearing more about, and I know our listeners would want to hear more about, uh, your reason for leaving the Senate. Was that a hard thing to do? Was that... Uh, oh, first, I wouldn't be so sure your listeners would be interested in this answer, but uh, I'll, I'll take you at your word. Look, I... Uh, I've had a series of moments where I make a decision, then I have to say, now what am I going to do? So uh, I didn't have a 15-year-old moment (laughs) where I said, I'm going to be a cook. So uh, I was single. Uh, uh, Lawrence O'Donnell was working for Pat Moynihan, who became my best friend in the Senate. And he said, there's a woman up in New York you ought to meet. So she came down to see the Vermeer at the National Gallery on 7 December 1995, and I fell in love with her. That's how you met Sarah. Yeah. I yeah. did not know that story. Yeah, so... Okay, well, that's so, a pretty good reason. Yeah, so I felt, anyway, so I fell in love with her, and, you know, she... Both of us had a little bit of a commitophobia going on, and eventually uh, uh, she said, okay, I'll marry you, but the condition is you got to agree to at least try to have a baby. And it wasn't a question of, of if, it's only a question with whom. She had sperm donors landed from here to L.A., so... <laughs> uh, she, I finally said, okay, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try, but I can't stay in the Senate because I had raised two kids in politics. And it's just harder. The Senate's harder on a family than, a, than being governor. Yeah. So I said, okay, um, I'll, I'll do it. And announced that I wasn't going to run. I did a little bit of work on that, but announced that I wasn't going to run. And a couple of days later, I get a call from the new school. They had a failed search, and they offered me a job as president of the new school, you know, uh, BS in pharmacy from the University of Nebraska. So we got married, and I got a 17-year-old. So and does at the it, moment, I'm ahead on points. Does it also mean you have to watch Lawrence O'Donnell every night at 10 o'clock now? Well, I, <laughs> I'm gonna go, I, I don't have to, but I have. I, when he, especially when he first took over for Overman, I watched yeah. him. Well, I, I need to thank you because um, you took a small little school in New York and turned it into a, a pretty important school here in the city. My son is actually attending the new school right now, and, stud- oh, really? and he's studying right? food policy. It's yeah. a very good school, yeah. uh, and we try to. I mean, it, it, it's the food policy program could be an awful lot larger. I mean, I think it's among the most important issues that the country is facing: trying to figure out what to eat, where to eat, how to cook, how to take care of ourselves. When the relationship between health and food is obvious, you've mentioned a couple in the extreme example. I mean, the SNAP program lasts eleven days, 
I mean, if, if you're on a, if you're a SNAP beneficiary, the average d- amount of time that you're able to use those uh, uh, certificates to buy food is 11 days. So that means, you know, just you've got 19 more days. You've got to figure out how to feed yourself. So it's obvious you've got a big shortage, but you've got more than just that. It, it, it's how do you grow it, how do you distribute it. I mean, all kinds of issues that are connected to it mm-hmm. uh, that uh, I think are enormously important. People talk about our, our food system being broken uh, as kind of a shorthand for, I think, a lot of the things that Bob just described. And I know you, Tom, have talked about the dominance of corporate interests when sure. it comes to making decisions sure. about our food. And, Bob, you probably had to represent a, a number of corporate interests of yeah. being a senator from Nebraska. What kind of things do we need to be thinking about or moving towards to get the, the you know, the, the phrase the food system is broken to me seems so large as to almost be, you know, not that useful. I don't know. I don't, it, it doesn't tell me what I need to do. Yeah. Let's, let's sort of unpack that a little bit. So, um, when a system is broken, it's, it's not reaching as many people as possible. Um, and mostly, you know, you talked about food deserts and people that are living in areas where they can't find fruits and vegetables. Also, when we're talking about food insecurity, we're, we're not only talking about a deficit in, in calories, but we're talking about a deficit in nutrition. Um, the idea that people can't actually feed themselves healthy food to live a, 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 a healthier lifestyle. Um, and so if, if you look, think about our, our electrical system. You know, you, you, no matter where you are in this country, for the most part, you know, the entire country, whether you're living in a, in, a, in a large house or a trailer or an apartment, you know you throw the light switch on, the lights come on. If you plug your computer in, the computer works. There's an electrical system that, that works and reaches everyone. But we have a food system that's not reaching everyone for a lot of different reasons, but mostly because of dollars. And so that's where the system is really broken. There's a lot of links along the, the, the line. You can talk about whether or not we're, we're you know, creating a system of monocropping that is leading to an overuse of nitrogen-based fertilizers that's causing runoff, that's causing pollution in the Gulf. There's all kinds of problems, that, that individual problems that are broken. But I, I think the, the, the bigger problem with our food system is just not reaching everyone the way it should. Yeah, I have a little bit, personally, I have trouble with the broken metaphor because you hear it all the time, Washington, right. D.C. is broken. Well, yeah. you know, I can throw this glass against a wall and it'll break. The, the real question seems to be in the food system, it, does it permit the kind of innovation that will produce a different outcome, produce healthier people, produce something different than what the current system does? Mm-hmm. And that's hard. I mean, I remember, I don't know if you remember this or not, but, but one of the big uh, food manufacturers came in, into my office right after I was senator, was on the Ag Committee, and they were complaining because the school lunch program didn't allow raisin brands in the, in the, in the school lunch. I thought, well, that doesn't seem right. Raisins, brand, that, that seems good. Well, it turns out the reason was it was like 80% sugar. It right. uh, mm-hmm. had nothing to do with raisins. If they were selling raisin brand, they'd have got in the, in the door. And they eventually persuaded the Ag Committee, not me, but they persuaded the Ag Committee to put it back in the school lunch program. So mm-hmm. you have significant forces, and I'm sympathetic. You've got a public company. You've got to make your numbers, but you've got to create a system whereby the innovators that want to deliver healthy food, that want to do things differently, to see a different outcome other than just generating profit, uh, that, that they have an opportunity to, to, to get in the door and be successful. And that's, it's hard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, a more recent example of that was, it was with the WIC program, the Women, yeah. Infant, and, Ch- and, and Children Supplemental Feeding Program, designed to pr- supplement diets, particularly with fruits and vegetables and healthy foods. And the potato lobby uh, spent an enormous amount of resources to make sure that oh, yeah. just recently that potatoes are now included. And um, that's not what most low-income families need the most. But yeah. um, it's, no, very, it's, a, it's, it's very real... hard to combat that. It's, it's not impossible to combat it, Billy. I mean, I, I do think m- maybe your listeners would benefit from this. If You don't have to be a lawyer to write a law. And every one of these big interest groups in D.C. understand that. They've got people that write laws. And they walk up and they say, Senator Windbag, would you support this amendment on the Farm Bill when it comes up? And they give you 50 words. And ask you, will you support uh, Senator Winbag this legislation? And yeah, I will, because you're giving me a five thousand dollar pack check. Why shouldn't I? Uh, so a citizen needs to come in and say, I've got fifty words as well, and I want them in the law. And it's it's remarkable. You when you're talking to Senator Winbag, he's got to say or she got to say yes or no. You give him the opportunity to say, well, you know, sit in the middle and say maybe. And then you have to use the National Rifle Association language and say, I'll never support you again unless you support these 50 words. You, yeah, you've got to be pretty aggressive. And citizens that do that, I, I think, oftentimes generate substantial success. I think that's right. Well, let me ask you both, a, uh, another, well, let me ask you both <laughs> another political question because you're so good, Bob, at, at framing uh, these things politically. One of the things I feel like we're soon going to be facing 
at Share Our Strength. We've made so much progress enrolling kids in programs like school breakfast and summer meals. And uh, and one of the hard truths, I think, politically <laughs> is, uh, although everybody is in favor of feeding a child, right? I hear this all the time, like, who would be against what you're doing? Who's against feeding a kid? One of the best things we can do for most kids is find a way to support their parents and to, and, and to strengthen the household and the family's economy. And I don't know the, the way to make the case for that politically because the parents are just, they're frankly not always as sympathetic a figure as a child is. How, do you, how should we think about that? Well, I think you've got to figure it out. You don't need any help from me. Just repeat what you just said. I mean, look, I think you've got to come and first of all, my argument with the current administration is it's not just about jobs. Now, you're, you're looking at the stock market. You're looking at the number of jobs. Those are, those are interesting numbers and not unimportant numbers. Uh, but what else are you looking at? Are you looking at the status of the individual in the home? Are you looking at what, what's it like if you're, if you're out there making, let's say, twice the minimum wage? You're making, uh, let's say, $60,000, $45,000 after tax. What's that look like in New York City? What's it look like in New Jersey? If you're medium family income at $28,000 a year, what's your life look like? And, and, and you're going to come up short. I mean, Felicity Huffman giving fifteen thousand dollars to her kid, and they're maybe going to throw her in jail. And that's an example of income inequality. That's not a, the the bigger example is the correlation between household income and SAT and ACT we'll talk results. Talk about that a little bit. You were at the New School, right? Well, so you probably know something about this when you were president. Yeah, I mean, it's it's you you. you I don't have the data hold up my head, although, as you probably have witnessed, in fact, you did it once when you were out there saying, studies show that school breakfast works, and somebody walked up and says, what study are you what looking study? at? Yeah. There weren't any studies. So, <laughs> as you know, 78.56% of all statistics are made up on the spot, so <laughs> I'm about to make up one. Uh, like, I, I just, I, 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 I think this, the, the central question here is, what's it like? You've got a job. Uh, what's it like to tr- try to support the family? You've got both mom and dad working, uh, they got to drop the kid off at daycare. Okay, well, how much money can I spend on daycare? Six thousand dollars, seven thousand dollars. What's it take to hire a really good professional to take care of, that's comparable to a mom or comparable to a dad? More like eighteen thousand dollars. So I think you have to get down inside that person's life. And I don't think President Trump has any idea what it's like to live inside that. You have to make the case that it takes more. And I, I don't. And I think you can't forget to do exactly what you suggested earlier, which is to say it can't just be the government. Some of it has to be the private sector. Some of it has to be the not-for-profit. You know, Americans are shockingly generous when it comes to wanting to take care and help people. But absent a government that's trying to respond to that shortage and that shortfall, it's impossible for me to imagine the American dream is going to come true for enough people to give me confidence the country's going to be better 20 years a day than it is now. No, I, I think one way is to maybe work up the ladder. And so Share of Strength has done a great job with with children in uh, primary school. Um, let's move to college now. There's, I was at Kane University in New Jersey, and something like 60% of the students can't feed themselves. They don't have uh, uh, meal meal programs. Their parents can't afford it. Colleges now have food pantries. A lot of, I mean, There was shopping. a food pantry there. Colleges have food pantries there was a and food, soup kitchens. Yep, there was a food pantry there. And so, but as your, your listeners may or may not know, you're, if you're a college student, you can't collect SNAP or receive SNAP unless you're working 20 hours. So there's a work requirement in there. You have to work at least 20 hours. So you're asking a college student when they're supposed to be spending their time studying, maybe doing some you know, socializing, but, <laughs> but that, that, that and, 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 and they're trying to get great grades because they want that next job. They, they, they want to graduate with, 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 uh, with high marks. And you're telling them they have to work to feed themselves in school. And so that's something, that's a policy that could change and should change, um, and will feed a, a, a lot of kids who are struggling in, in college right now. Yeah, the, in the, st- the statistics I was going to say earlier, I don't, don't, don't hold me this, but if you look at household income at $15,000, you can get an answer to the question, what's the SAT score of that kid in that household? And you say, okay, let's, let's, let's take it up uh, $10,000. What's it look? And the SAT goes up. So the, let's take it up another 10000 The SAT goes up. Every time you increase the household income, the SAT goes up, and the ACT goes up. It has nothing to do with your kids, you know, that's, that's why I say I think it's a big distraction looking at Felicity Huffman and these people that have, that have bought their kids into college. Household income does that. We were talking about it before we went on the air about, you, can I afford a tutor for my son? Yes. Can most people afford a tutor for the son? No, they can't. And, and that's where the real disparity occurs. So I think 
back to your original question, how do you frame this thing? I think you have to come to reasonable conservatives and reasonable uh, uh, moderates and say, you can't continue the status quo. If all you're looking at the, is at the stock market and the number of jobs created every quarter, you're missing something enormously important because people, people are living differently today. I mean, I got out of high school in 1961. Uh, we got out of high school in 1961. The, the, the average kid that went, went to work, there was a pension. There was health care. They, you know, they went in the military for a couple of years. They came back. The job was still there. They could support a whole family on it. Not anymore. An unskilled job today, you know, you'll be lucky if you command $10, 12 $15 an hour. And, boy, it's tough to live on that if that's your household income. Well, talk, talk a little bit about some of the education stuff that you're working on now because that, I think, is geared towards helping uh, young people get prepared for the economy of the future. Um, and, and you're involved in a number of efforts. One, I know, is the Minerva Institute, of which you're the executive chair. Tell us what that is. Well, I mean, it begins, by the way, the passion for higher education. And the purpose of a liberal arts education is prepare a man or woman to be a good citizen. That's the purpose. Uh, and, okay, you want to learn computer science so you can make a lot of money when you graduate, fine, do that as well. But you've got to understand what it takes, what kind of habits of, of mind are necessary to be a good citizen once you graduate. That's the key of, to me, the key output of a liberal arts education. And there's tremendous financial need. I mean, Minerva is, a, is a, a startup university out in San Francisco. It's quite innovative. The curriculum is very exciting, I find. The kids go have a foundational year. It's a residential program in San Francisco. They go to a different international city every semester for the next three years. But it is militantly need-blind. And even though our tuition is $11,000 a year, uh, room and board is So $26,000 after tax, that's a big number. And so, you know, three-fourths of our students have financial need. So, and, and back to what you were talking about, Edward, the not-for-profit, yes, some of, we don't do Title IV. I personally think the student loan program is a scam, so I, I, we stay away from that, which means I've got to turn to individual Americans. I mean, last year, Americans gave away $450 billion, of, uh, uh, which is a lar- you know, larger than the GDP of 12 nations, other than 12 nations on Earth. It's a big number. So... Uh, you got to turn to the private sector to get contributions to help these kids go to college. And fortunately, there's plenty of people willing to, you know, willing to be generous and part with some of their cash to help kids go to school. Yeah, I mean that's all that's all well and good. But if 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 these large companies just paid people more money, they wouldn't have to actually come in and, and pretend to be some some white knight saving you know saving the world. Um, well, but even if it, 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 I don't, I don't disagree with that. I mean, if you, you're saying ba- basically increase wages for individuals, sure. but but even there, I mean, uh, so let's say everybody paying the minimum wage, everybody paying fifteen dollars an hour, twenty dollars an hour. I mean, regardless, you still got need. You yeah, still that's, gonna... that's that's minimum. That's I mean, if if, if minimum wage goes to fifteen dollars an hour, I don't pay my employees fifteen dollars an hour. They're getting paid more than fifteen dollars an hour. Maybe the lowest porter is making fifteen, sixteen dollars an hour, but it, it, all salaries go up. But but also, what I don't understand is that we're consumers consumer economy, you would think that you want to put more money in the hands of people that will spend it. Because you give a, you give a race to someone who's making forty fifty thousand dollars $50,000, they'll spend every single penny of that. You give a, a, a race to someone who's making you know, $10 million in, in, in form of a tax break, they're not spending that money. And so if you really want to, want to juice the economy, you want to put the hands in, you know, money in more hands of people that, that will spend it. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. I mean, the economics oftentimes, and particularly when you go in the rural area where mo- there's higher poverty in rural America than there sure. is in urban America. When I mean, you get in the rural area, it's difficult because it's, it's a lot of service jobs out there, and it's difficult to be able to pay an employee enough to be able to cover the costs that we're, we're talking about. So mm-hmm. it's back to somehow, uh, in addition to the marketplace, in addition to the marketplace, you've got to get the government in there, and I think you, you are going to need individual philanthropy. Right. And, and even if it's not cash, I mean, the non-cash uh, contribution that's coming and uh, uh, people volunteering and giving their time like you're doing for Share Our Strength is also enormously important. I just, I don't want to, I don't want to discount the importance of uh, people caring enough to give up time or income Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to causes that that they care about. Sure. And Bob, you had talked about the the fact that, you know, right now the current administration, President Trump, really just focuses on jobs growth and the stock market. And it feels to me like there are so many lost opportunities, so many things our country could be working on with a different kind of national leadership. But one of the things I'm curious about, uh, and you're a student of history, and I try to be as well. So when you look at it in a historical context, you know that there have been other times where the country has been divided and polarized. Even 
discounting for that, this still feels like a unique time to me at least. And I'm wondering whether you both think, since you're both political, do you feel like this is energizing our democracy or suppressing it? I know Because I've seen both. I, I see a lot of people who are very energized and, and tend to be very involved in the next election. And I see others who feel like uh, I've got to stop watching the news and I've got to just, you know, move to my little, you know, cottage in Maine and, and not pay attention to this because it's, it's bad for my blood pressure. Uh, which do you think it's doing, or, or both? Both. Both. Yeah, I'd agree. Yeah. The, the real question for us is, do we care enough to make the effort to, to do our share of our contribution to making it, make it possible for the country, democracy, to survive? Because democracy is a bitch. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is hard. It's hard. <laughs> it is really hard, you know. So I said, so, so, well, we fought that last year. Why do we have to do it again? I said, it, it's a, <laughs> you know, it's a gift that keeps on giving. you got to keep at it. I just think that we... we uh, people who are sending messages out there need to sort of think about a, a, maybe a different way to match these things. For instance, let's look at education. So if you believe that a certain amount of college, this should be free college, I think saying, saying free college is not going to work. And so if you look at public education, there was a time we didn't have public education in this country. When we pushed for, for public education, there were plenty of people who pushed back against it. You know, back then, only wealthy people can afford to actually send their kids to school. There were some charitable organizations that uh, provided opportunities, but we didn't have a public school system. So we now have a a 12-year public school system, and there's been a great push for universal pre-K because we realized that kids coming from wealthier households, they had a leg up going into kindergarten because they can afford to have pre-K. So now there's a push for universal pre-K. What we now need to do is say, to prepare people for the future, 12 years isn't enough anymore. We need to provide 14 years of public education. And so that all of a sudden changes the conversation to saying, well, how are we can prepare people for, for the future versus let's give something free out. The result is the same, but I think just, just how it lands on the American public, I think will change if we just kind of reframe, reframe the issue. When the Constitution was written in 1787, among the decisions that was made in Philadelphia was to give the state's authority for, for education, for educating the uh, children. I think it worked quite well for higher education, particularly after the land-grant colleges and the GI Bill. And there was opposition uh, to the GI Bill. That didn't sail through either. But the, but the K-12 through effort is all decentralized. Uh, the states, they, they've all set up their own school districts. So it's it just the politics of it get difficult when you, when you have that decentralization. But in New York State, there are 200,000 babies, live babies born every single year. I'll bet you I can tell you by zip code which 40,000 aren't going to graduate from high school. Hmm. 40,000 of those babies are not going to graduate from high school. Uh, and that is a huge problem. It's a moral problem, and it's an economic problem. Uh, and you're not going to solve it with just paying attention to Wall Street and the number of jobs that are being created every quarter. Yeah. Well, and, you know, one of the things this conversation evokes for me, and for sure our strength, this was even preceded the current uh, White House, was, uh, and Tom knows this well, it was we got very focused on what can you get done at the state and local level. Um, all of our colleagues were spending time lobbying on Capitol Hill, and we found that there were a lot of things governors actually controlled. You were a governor, Bob, and yeah. you know you know the difference between being a governor and a senator. Uh, I just had the great opportunity, thanks to Governor uh, uh, Steve Bullock from Montana, to speak at the National Governors Association winter meeting in February. 47 of the 50 governors came, and he asked me to come speak at a, at a private lunch. And what was so interesting about it to me was not that I had this opportunity to speak, but sitting there before I spoke, you're looking at these governors, and unlike all of what we've been so habituated to in Washington, none of them are trying to take each other down. None of them are trying to score points on each other. None of them gain if the other loses. And so you had Democrats and Republicans kind of sitting next to each other or hollering across the room, uh, you know, hey, uh, JB, I ought to show you what we did on this JB Pritzker from Illinois. Let me show you what we did in our state uh, on education, and maybe some of our staff can talk to some of yours and share some best practices. So there, there is a, a place in uh, American politics where people are still actually trying to work through disagreements. And, and, and these governors, by the way, they have you know, very different ideologies and politics. Right. But, they're, but the reflex is not to like take the other guy down. And it's just so different. And you were, I'm sure you were able no, to get I, things I, done when you were governor. Yeah, that you, when uh, you got to the Senate, you're like, God, it's I, a lot no, I think it's No, I think it's a really important thing you just said. I mean, you, you know my sister, Jessie. And yeah. the work, so my, my sister's been involved with 
early childhood ed- education out in Nebraska since way before it was cool. And Susie Buffett, through her foundation, set up this thing called Educare. And so she's running these early childhood operations all over the country. But it originates inside of a, inside of a, a state. And the governor's been relatively cooperative. The legislature's cooperative. But it's lots of private sector money that flows into it. But the bottom line fact is it costs $19,000 per child to give them a good preschool um, um, experience. So if, if, if you're looking at the issue of preschool, even at the state level, and they'll come into it in a hurry because it's very difficult to, to be a demagogue on, on that issue at the state level because you'll get down to it and say, okay, do you want to hire great people? Say, so, yeah, well, this is what it's going to cost to get it done. Uh, we're not winning every battle in that area, but it's easier. You're exactly right. It's, it's easier, and I think more, back to your other question, is it getting worse or getting better politically? I think you're much more likely to feel like democracy is working at the local level. Yeah, it does feel that way. Now, so my wife, Rosemary, yeah. who's in, in our, the outer room here, uh, she had this idea that we're starting to talk about, which was, you know, what if you, you know, there's so few places now where members uh, have any kind of intersection of, of the other party, right? They used to kind of hang out in the gym together and, you know, in the cloakrooms. And Rosemary was saying, why don't you do, and so many of these guys live in group houses, right? The men and women right. who go to Washington and live with two or three others. Uh, what if you did cooking classes for, you know, five or six members at a time, three Republicans, three senators, had Tom Colicchio uh, come down and right. do a, a cooking class and 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 then you know they learn about the food they cook together they eat together there's an opportunity to actually get to know each other as human beings not just as these partisan labels yeah there's an opportunity for a t- television show there too <laughs> don't you think i mean it, it, it's really i think it's <laughs> there could yeah. be all yeah. right so it's produced by rosemary shore and tom colicchio <laughs> okay go. all right yeah excellent wow i didn't waste my uh, morning um no i think i think you're exactly right so <laughs> we're gonna have we got to wrap up here but uh tom as somebody who uh, not being an elected official has found a way to make a big difference and to have a platform. Uh, just what advice do you have for others, whether they're other chefs, whether they're just other, you know, people who care about what's going on? How do you know if you're not a uh, governor or a senator, if you're not somebody that can write a five thousand uh, dollar check? How do you make more of a difference in this country? I, I think you show up. You know, you show up and, and, and you, you stay engaged. Um, you know, my first my first experience in Washington, I testified um, uh, one of the committees, um, uh, Miller's committee during the uh, childhood. Uh, George Miller. George Miller. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. During the uh, childhood nutrition reauthorization. This is uh, Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act before before it was it was uh, during during that debate. And um, five years later, six years later, I was there with him uh, at another press conference, and he, and he took me aside. He had just announced that he was retiring, and he took me aside, and he said, you know, Tom, you keep showing up. A lot of celebrities, they come here, they're here for a photo op, and that's it. We don't see them again. People are, people are, are keeping score. They know that you're coming here, and, and that's why you have impact. And so my suggestion to a, a lot of, especially a lot of the chef community that they want to get more involved, you can't do it once and think that you actually did something. You got you to keep showing up. Um, and to the average citizen, show up, um, get involved, um, whether it's on your, your, with your school board and your local school board, or if you have an issue, organize around that issue. And, and I mean, look, look what happened with the Women's March. I mean, that's a, that's a serious movement. Look what's going on with these kids from Parkland. Um, they are you know, making a difference. And so don't wait for it to affect you directly um, because that's usually when people get involved. Um, you know, don't wait for the next school shooting to become an activist around this issue. And so that, that would be my, my, my advice. You stay, to get involved, fear something that you're passionate about, get involved, stay involved, and use your voice. That's a great, that's pretty great advice. Uh, piece of just show up. Yeah. Okay, last question. It's always the hardest one um, since we have so many foodies who listen. <laughs> Uh, it might be harder for you, Tom, than for Bob, because you're going to have to pick among children. But uh, if you had to pick a special gem that you think people should know about, a place to eat, it could be in New York or anywhere else, and it can't be one of your restaurants. Oh, I'm the worst person to ask this question. I don't go out. So I have a, I have a besides a 25-year-old, I have a, a, an 8-year-old and a 9-year-old at home. And they're up at six o'clock in the morning. Um, they, I wake they don't want to go out, right? My fourteen-year-old no, never I wants wake to go up, out. Well, no, we can't take them out. They're they're not ready for <laughs> for restaurants yet. Um, and um, you know, my wife and I are up. She's up a lot earlier than I am. But getting them off to school and come eight o'clock at night, I'm exhausted. There are times I'll come home. It's like we're gonna have a date night. We're gonna go out. We get home and it's like no, we're not going anywhere. So I don't get out. Um, protege, the next restaurant that I want to have yours. The next, the next restaurant, restaurant that you that I want to go to is a restaurant here in, in New York called Adamix. 
Um, Adam, Adam a- X. A- a- I, I I think I just saw it as a food and wine best restaurant yeah. uh, released yesterday. Korean, yeah. Korean um, sort of uh, new Korean food. And, and so um, that seems to be really exciting to me. That, that's my, my next restaurant I want to get to. But I don't get out at all. You, Bob? Oh, I, I told Billy before you got here that I spent uh, Saturday, last Saturday, with Sukitha uh, Mehta, the guy that wrote Maximum City, uh, yes. wander, wandering around Jackson Heights for, for, for a day. And, you know, I just, I, I think local places where you can talk to people uh, is terrific. I mean, I, I, I like hanging out with other human beings, and there's right. hardly a better time to do it when they're eating. Right. Jackson yeah. Heights and Adam Mix. Adam Mix, exactly. Awesome. So grateful to both of you for doing this. Bob Carey, just such a, a mentor to me and such an honor to be able to work with you in the Senate, Congressional Medal of Honor winner, as we mentioned, from the Vietnam War, governor, senator, now with Allen and & Company, and uh, somebody who used to try to get me to eat vegetables. I think you've probably give, <laughs> given up on that. But, but an important influence in my life in that way as well. You're not going to tell that story? Uh, the, no, I'm not going to tell rum, that story. The, the no. rum story? <laughs> you have a good memory, though. And uh, Tom Colicchio, thanks for being involved for so long with um, Share Our Strength. And people can find you at Craft. They can find you on Top Chef. They can find your book, which I brought you to sign for Bob Carey's assistant's daughter, Mabel. I could do that. Uh, Tom Colicchio, Think Like a Chef. Uh, thanks for being with us on Ad Passion and Stir. Thanks, Bill. I'm Billy Shore. Thanks for listening. You can go to adpassionandstir.org and find previous episodes. You can rate us or rank us or subscribe and let your friends know about this podcast. Thanks for listening. Ad Passion and Stir is distributed by District Productive. Our executive producer is Peter Ogburn. Ad Passion and Stir is the creation of Billy Shore, Debbie Shore, and Paul Woody Woodhall. <laughs>